Coming up on Rob on the Road, Marvelous Museums. We'll explore Stockton's Hagen Museum with its world-class collection of California art and history. This is the Bierstadt that hung in which president's office? Travel to Yuba City to discover the history of some of Northern California's Native Americans. We are in the multicultural wing, and when you saw this area, you said, I gotta work here. Yes, yes I did. <laughs> and return to Sacramento's renowned Crocker Art Museum for a look at treasures inside the vault. I am going to show you one of the most special drawings in America, right here in Sacramento. Wow. Rob on the Road, Marvelous Museums starts now. And now, Rob on the Road, exploring California. Hi there, and welcome to this edition of Rob on the Road. California has some marvelous museums, some known worldwide, others perhaps less discovered. That's why we're here. We have found one for you today in Stockton. This is Victory Park. It's gorgeous, home to the Hagen Art Museum and an amazing collection of California art and history. Let's explore some of their amazing collections. So glad to be inside the Hagen Museum with Todd Rostaller, who is the CEO here. Good to see you. Good seeing you as well. Welcome to the Hagen Museum. Oh, it's been so nice just to walk around with you a bit and get a, a sneak peek, and now we're going to show it to you because this place is gorgeous. This is the hall room. This is the hall gallery, yes. And inside this gallery is home to one of your most prized collections, and that's just one of. Well, the Hagen Museum is home to one of the largest collection of major works by the Hudson River School artist Albert Bierstadt. Those are six of his major completed works. Exactly. That's what sets you apart. That is true. Okay, well one of them hung in a very famous location. Let's start with that one. Perfect. Come on. This is the Bierstadt that hung in which president's office? I'll give you a second to guess. That's a second, President Ronald Reagan. Exactly. During his first administration, they could pick paintings from any museum. They came to us and they asked to have this to hang during his first administration in the Roosevelt Room. Is this Bierstadt in the front? It is. He painted himself in. You can see he's making sketches, uh, taking a look down the valley. You have Half Dome and the rest of the absolutely majestic Yosemite Valley. And this is one of five Yosemite scenes that we have in our collection. So why are Bierstadt's Yosemite scenes some of the most famous? Did he have anything to do with popularizing Yosemite nationally? He did. He was very early on the scene in the 1860s, he was in the park long before it became a national park, and his paintings were displayed back east. Got a lot of people thinking, you know, maybe I should hop on that train and uh, travel for about a week to wow. go see Yosemite. This is one of my favorite paintings in the museum. I grew up in Stockton, and I wasn't a big art aficionado when I was young, but I was always struck by the Yosemite scenes. And of course, as a kid, we would travel to Yosemite and I could see all of the, the truth in his painting when I would actually visit Yosemite. I love that. You saw the truth in his painting and then actually you saw the truth in your life because this painting and his works helped call you to your career. Yes, they did. I hadn't thought about it that way, but yes. If you were to walk all the way through that painting looking up Yosemite Valley and turn around, this is what you'd see. With the sun going down, sunset in the Yosemite Valley, probably the most dramatic Bierstadt that we have in our collection. When visitors first come to the museum, if you were to watch them as they walk into this room, they're drawn to this one because it is so dramatic.
When you walk in the whole gallery, you see this right in front of you, this beautiful mantle. And it makes me think that this would have been a home in the past. It makes many of our visitors think that this used to be somebody's home and it was converted later on into a museum. In point of fact, we've always been a museum. And this was brought from? This was brought from a home on Fifth Avenue in New York that belonged to a gentleman by the name of Louis Tira Hagen. And it is his name, Hagen, that is associated with our museum. Now, why did they want to pour their money into Stockton and to here? Well, that's interesting because Isla Hagen had married in 1924 a gentleman by the name of Robert T. McKee, an interior designer in New York who just happened to be originally from Stockton. Okay, there's that's the trace. That's Stockton connection. Robert T. McKee knew his hometown was struggling to build an art museum and persuaded his wife Isla to donate part of the family's $10 million estate to Stockton if a museum would be built and named in honor of her father. It worked, paving the way for the creation of the Hagen Museum. I now want to introduce you to the Lion Decker Gallery. Oh, this is beautiful. Th those are the Kellogg kids. The Kellogg's kids, one of his more famous advertising campaigns. Wow. He, he was hired uh, right at the beginning of the 20th century to help popularize Kellogg's cornflakes. Lion Decker is really credited for helping to brand quite a number of products in the United States during the first four decades of the 20th century. That's a long run. A very long run. Uh, this campaign ran uh, up until just around the time the United States had entered the First World War. And if you take a look at the faces, there are these winsome little cherubic kids that the whole point of this was to win the heart of the mothers who were then going to go out and buy the cereal. And why wouldn't you want your child to be as happy and as contented as these kids seem to be in eating a big bowl of Kellogg's Corn Flakes? Would this have been during the beginning of persuasive advertisement campaigns? Very much so. This was a gift from Norman Rockwell to the Hagen Museum. Right. And the story behind this is Norman Rockwell, the artist that most Americans most closely associate with the Saturday Evening Post, and this is a cover for the Saturday Evening Post magazine. But this is a Lion Decker. But this is a Lion Decker. J.C. Lion Decker was doing covers for the Saturday Evening Post long before Norman Rockwell, and more importantly, Norman Rockwell looked upon J.C. Leyendecker not only as a friend, but as a mentor. The Hagen Museum is art and history, history museum on this side, and the famous Stevens Brothers boats. Right here. World famous, all made in Stockton between 1902 and when they closed their doors in 1987. And we have all of the Stevens Brothers archives here at the, the museum. Really? All the marine architect drawings, photographs, hull files on the majority of the vessels they built over that period of time. This particular vessel is a 26-foot runabout built in 1927 for a gentleman by the name of Herbert Fleischacker. And some of your viewers might remember when the San Francisco Zoo was known as Fleischacker Zoo. Well, that was Herbert Fleischacker. And he had this vessel up at his uh, summer home in Lake Tahoe. Another thing invented in Stockton, the Caterpillar tractor. Right, as some people say, Stockton's motto should be home of the Caterpillar tractor. Well, it would work yes. because this is you know, known worldwide. Exactly, because of the track type tread. Why was that developed this way? Was it because of the soft land? The land just to the west of Stockton, tremendously fertile. It's all reclaimed delta land, and the soil is a soft, rich peat soil. You can grow anything in the world practically there. The problem when it's wet it is soft, 
and spongy, and the big heavy machinery of the period had a tendency to sink down. Mm. So Benjamin Holt took a look at the problem and thought, I've got to come up with some mechanical means of giving more surface bearing area to these machines without adding appreciably to the weight. The oldest combine harvester held by a museum is at the Smithsonian, and it's a Stockton built side hill harvester. The second oldest combine on display in the United States is our 1904 Haynes Hauser harvester. This one. this one right behind you. How cool is that? So it's this one and the Smithsonian. And both made in Stockton. That is fantastic. This is a beautiful location. The Hagen Museum here in Victory Park in Stockton is just spectacular. I had not been in here before, and I am blown away. Well, we want you to come and visit again. I and we will. want all your viewers to come and visit as well. Did you know that Yuba City is home to a fascinating living history museum? This is the Community Memorial Museum of Sutter County. And among its many amazing stories is that of the Native Americans who originated in this region and live here today. Jessica Haugen is the curator here at the museum, and thank you for letting us in your doors. Oh, thank you for being here. We're really thrilled about it. It's beautiful in here. Thank you. I stumbled upon this place when I did a show on the Sutter Buttes, and I'm mm -hmm. so glad I did, yeah. because inside are treasures everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hear that from a lot of folks in the community, that they've lived here forever, they didn't know we're here, we're really a hidden gem in the community, so that's actually something we're working on. It's nice to be a hidden gem, but not this hidden. <laughs> I get it. That's why we're here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is where we're going to start, and this is a circular map of the Sutter Buttes. Mm -hmm. It is so wild to be in the middle of this. Yes. But this gives you a perspective that I did not see when I was there. Yeah, it's really fantastic to have this almost aerial view of what the Sutter Buttes really are and how much area they encompass. So much history has happened in this area. Let's mm -hmm. get started yeah. on the tour. Absolutely. Let's do it. Blacksmithing was a, a very common trade mm -hmm. uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Think of it as like a modern day uh, mechanic, yes, garage mechanic. Absolutely. That's what mm -hmm. it was back then. And this is one from Sutter County. Yeah, so all of the blacksmith tools in this exhibit right here came from the blacksmith shop on the Onstott Ranch, which anyone from this area will recognize that name as a long-standing family in the area. Many people settled in this area because they came here for the gold rush mm -hmm. and realized that the Sierras were just too tough. So they started farming here. Yes, yes, a lot of people ended up in Sutter County for just that reason. And that's why Marysville, even though it's not part of Sutter County, mm -hmm. it's Yuba County, mm -hmm. but that's why Marysville is so part of your Sutter story. Yes, you cannot tell the story of Sutter County without talking about Yuba County, the gold rush, all the people who came up here for the gold rush, because that really is our history too. And everything here is named for that man right yes, there, yes. John Sutter. <laughs> There's a lot of Sutter, Sutter Buttes, <laughs> the county of Sutter, the town of Sutter. John Sutter was really the first sort of Western settler in the area to start farming on a large scale. And his property reached almost all the way down to Sacramento. He owned a lot of land in this area. The things in this case we know belonged to John Sutter. Everyone asks about the large gun in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to talk about the Bowie knife because I think it's a lot more interesting. Okay. <laughs> Look at the etching on the so, knife. Yeah, the knife is beautiful. Um, Sutter actually left it with a gunsmith mm -hmm. in Marysville. 
and then left town. He moved back to Pennsylvania and never came back for the knife. You said a lot of people ask about the gun. What is it they ask? Oh, well, what is it? How would you carry a gun that you big? Carry that gun? Uh, especially our school kids when they come in for their field trips. They're just, you know, I mean, it's a monstrous thing. It's actually a rampart gun. It's not meant to be carried. You would mount it on the ramparts in a defensive position around a fort. And that's how Sutter used it at his farm. Hawk Farm was the name. I'm sure you know why he named it Hawk Farm. Why? He actually named it for a nearby Indian village. Sutter was Indian a little village. bit progressive in that he hired a lot of different kinds of people to work for him. And some people say had a little more respect for minority communities than other people who were here in that time. Cheryl, the story of the natives is so deep and interesting. Where do we begin? We begin somewhere between four and 10,000 years ago. We haven't quite pinned it down. Uh, the Nisanan Maidu, the Maidu are separated into multiple groups. The Nisanan Maidu lived here along the Feather River. In fact, Yuba City's name comes from a Maidu word of Yubu, which oh. was the name of the village, which was located about where the courthouse, the old courthouse is in that area. Most times when you see a place that there's a town next to a river, it's on top of an Indian village because they lived there first. Mm. And that's how Yuba City works. There are some wonderful artifacts yes. and relics here. I see arrowheads, I see andesite. You know, these are from the buttes. The buttes yeah. as well, and then these grinders. There's grinding stones, very common. These are single stones. Sometimes you can find them where they're a bedrock and there might be a hundred holes worked in each in the stone where the women work together. Everything that we think of as boxes, Tupperware, cookware, dishes, storage, the Nisanat did it with baskets. Wow. So the women traditionally wove the baskets. These are a few examples of local basketry that we have. They're art. They are art. Their art and their mathematics. Everybody had to count stitches to make the pattern come out evenly. These women could see these baskets in three dimension when they started. When were the natives here in large numbers? Actually, the Hudson Bay Company came through the valley in 1833, and not intentionally, they brought malaria. They went to Monterey, they moved their way back up to Northern California and the areas they'd been before, and some of these villages were 1,500 people, mm. were decimated. Because of malaria. Of malaria. And that wiped out in the valley up to 75% of the population like that. Unbelievable. Then you had the gold miners coming in and the farmers and natives were in the way. And so in the 1850s. To them. To them. In the 1850s, you had removal policy. And in the 1850s, the native people who lived in Sutter County were forcibly moved over to Clusa County into the Nomlaki Reservation. Of course, people filtered back. Do you know what I love about what you just said? People. Oh, yes. It's everybody. It's just people. Mm -hmm. And so many people have been treated so differently for many different unfair reasons. And that happened here, too. Oh, very much so, yes. We are in the multicultural wing, and when you saw this area, you said, I gotta work here. Yes, yes I did. <laughs> it's really, really rare, you could almost say unique, for a museum of our size to have a gallery like this. We wanna make sure we're telling your story here. I love here. that, I love that. So there that. was community involvement in every single one of these exhibits. So this wing covers Mexican Americans, Chinese Americans, the Punjabi American community, which is quite substantial here. Uh, the Japanese Americans, there's a bit on our sister city uh, relationship with Torre Japan, and then we have an exhibit on the Hmong Americans who are here as well. This shows so many of the stories that were told then and that were lived then. Yes. Um, I love that you brought out the word community because I don't think you can really live anywhere unless you celebrate all the communities. Yes. Yes. That's what makes you whole, and that's mm -hmm. what you said makes this museum whole. Mm -hmm. So what would you say for this museum if you could say something? I think this museum would say, 
come and visit, for one, as we discussed, we're very well hidden even amongst our own residents. But I would also say keep an eye on us for what we're up to in the future. We have a lot of plans for updates, for changes. We have big things coming. Of course, one of Northern California's most renowned museums is the incredible Crocker Art Museum in downtown Sacramento. It's a place you can visit often and always find something new and fascinating. Let's return to the Crocker to once again explore the entire state under one roof. This is quite a special way to see the Crocker Art Museum. We are here with the queen of the Crocker, <laughs> <laughs> Director Lyle Jones. Good to see you, Lyle. Rob, thank you so much. It's great to be here. This is a world-class art museum, and you're gonna show us why. Great, I'm delighted to do so. The museum was founded in 1885, so it's been around for a very long time. We're in the Gold Rush Gallery right now. Here you can look back and forward all at the same time. I love that. The museum has the best collection of California art from statehood to the present day of any institution. If you want to understand the art of California, you come to the Crocker. California is a new state. It is coming out of the gold rush when Judge Crocker arrives in 1854. He only served as a Supreme Court Justice for one year. Uh, he really then did what he is most famous for and where his major wealth came from. He became the president and legal counsel of the Central Pacific Railroad. He negotiated a retirement settlement that was actually quite handsome. Judge Crocker took his uh, retirement earnings, uh, had a, the gallery building built, and then took his family to Europe for three years to buy a collection to fill it. My goodness. It's pretty amazing. The Crocker Art Museum's Works on Paper collection is? One of the best in the world. In the world. And you know, the fun thing here is, this is what you get the specialness of coming on a tour with me. Okay. Because the general public doesn't normally get to do this. Well, Come they get in. to now. Thank you. Where we're going is the vault. It'll take me a minute. I've got to, like, unlock it here. Okay. I love vaults. Secret code. My goodness. This is special. This is. In fact, most people don't get to do this, but you're special. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's because this is part of the community. Well, you know, and this is, as I said, um, the works on paper, uh, the, the museum's collection, our master drawings are world famous. This room houses those drawings. It also holds photography, Indian and Persian miniatures, Japanese prints, all sorts of artwork that are done on paper. And so these are closed up, they're sealed off. Can you show us some of them? I'm going to. Okay. Stay right here. Okay. And you know what? Mm -hmm. Keep your hands behind you. Okay. <laughs> you know me well. I am going to show you one of the most special drawings in America, right here in Sacramento. Wow. This is a work by an artist named Albrecht Durer. Okay. World famous. Many, many collections across the country have Durer's prints in them. Very few have his actual drawings. This is the first Durer drawing ever to come to the United States. First of all, another work on paper. This is a St. John the Baptist, but here's Albrecht Durer. This is Nude with Staff, done in 1498. Think about that, 1498. Wow. Uh, 1498, Lyle. You can see that, and you can see the AD of his signature right there. This is a nude with staff. Uh, the, what she's holding in her hand is actually an artist's staff for drawing. Um, you, I love this drawing in that you look at her shoulder, it just kind of disappears as she's bending around. You see her muscular uh, nature of those shoulders. Um, this is when Durer was a fairly young man, just in his 20s. He went on to be one of the most famous artists in the world. Uh, this is the very first drawing by Albert Durer to come to the United States. Judge Crocker purchased it in 1869. People come from all over the world to study the Crocker's collection because it's so important, especially with German drawings. They also come because the works are so fresh. Mm. Uh, you look at works in our collection next to other works of the same time, and very often the other works are faded so much you can't really see the hand of the artist. 
You just said the hands of the artist. The hand of the artist. That's something that art historians study always, and you learn it better by looking at works on paper, by looking at drawings, than you ever do by looking at other media. And each of these files filled with beautiful works on paper. Okay. Another artist you might have heard of. Okay. Rembrandt. Oh, really? Really. So I've got this one. I'll just bring it over to you. Okay. I've got this one set up. I thought that this would be fun. One, not because it is the most fabulous drawing in the world, but because here you really do see the hand of the artist. So this is very much a working drawing, a drawing where he's discovering the architecture of the final work of art that he wants to create. That is fascinating to me, Lyle, that these works on paper take you in to the talent and the thought process of the artist. You know what's interesting, people like Rembrandt, he worked with a variety of different studio assistants. So when you see his paintings, you see his paintings, but you also see his students' work in front of you. Um, here, it's all him. How old is this Rembrandt? This is uh, 16th century. 16th century. What a treasure. Isn't that great? It transcends time and place. It takes me that close to Rembrandt. Mm. That's pretty amazing. And so does the Crocker. I hope so, always. What Golden State treasures, preserved and protected for generations to come thanks to these marvelous museums. We'll see you next time, right here on Rob on the Road.